We're live on Facebook. We are recording. Three, two, one. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the U.S. and around the world. Hey, thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Pete Caliendo, and we are thrilled that you can join us for another episode of Baseball Outside the Box. Um, we always try to bring you some of the top people in the game in the U.S. and around the world. And before we begin and tell you about our guest, this is going to be a great one, um, do us a favor. Just go to YouTube, Peter Caliendo. You see the big red button like this. Subscribe, hit it. Um, if you like the show, share it. We got over 100 shows just on YouTube. And remember, all the audio goes on our podcast, Baseball Outside the Box. Um, that's been around three years. There's a lot of past shows. Go there and check them out. All about baseball development. Great, great experts, like I said, in the U.S. and around the world. I want to thank everybody for joining us. This is going to be a thrill. Let me tell you about our guests real quick, and we'll get rocking and rolling. First of all, Darren Ebert. Um, was Got a chance to meet him through social media. We talked a little bit. Very interesting background. First of all, played in the big leagues, and he pitched with, uh, think about this, three Hall of Famers, Maddox, Glavin, and Smoltz. You know we got to ask him about that. I mean, all the experiences that those guys had, what he learned from them. And get this, he played in Moneyball. He played Mike Magnante, and I should be able to pronounce that Italian name. Um, he's the left-handed pitcher who got traded. Um, spent 10 years with the Reds as a pitching coach also. And this year, 2020, was going to be one of the managers. Unfortunately, coronavirus hit. We'll talk to him about that. Um, we're going to talk about pitch design also and some other things. But let me just welcome from Arizona, Darren Eber. Darren, how you doing, buddy? Doing good. Thanks, Pete. Hey, thank you for joining us. Um, I really appreciate it because, you know, it's interesting the background you have. Um, but I want to take, you know, one thing I don't know from your background, I want to take the audience back a little bit. It's always fun. You know, when you started playing baseball when you were young, how, why, you know, why did you, you know, play baseball? Obviously, all young kids in the U.S. want to play. But kind of how, what your youth career was like before you got to the big leagues. Well, <laughs> Actually, I, I played all sports. You know, I did, I did everything from golf to tennis to football to, to baseball. Um, stop. Wait. Yeah. Wait, wait, Darren, wait. I got to stop you only for a second. Folks, did you just hear what he said? Okay. This is not a scripted show. It's unbelievable. I mean, everybody, the reason I bring that up, and sorry to interrupt there, and only because, yep. and I won't do that during the show, just this one time was because we emphasize so much, especially 13 under, be a multi-sport athlete. It's detrimental not being a multi-sport athlete. And I'll stop there and you keep going. No, actually, it would, to me, it was the key to my success uh, coming up and getting drafted out of high school. But the funny thing is, two years ago, I had my high school number retired at my high school in California. And I went back there and it was the alumni baseball game. And, and some guys even 20 years ago that were playing with me were there. And they would have sworn it was my basketball jersey that had gotten retired before my baseball jersey, you know. Great. But it was just it, in that era, that, that was the thing. There was no travel teams, you know. He wasn't playing one sport year round. You just moved from one to the other. And, I, and honestly, I think there's something you can learn from every sport that you play, whether it's just discipline, um, different types of movements that your body goes through so that, you know, you just become more and more athletic and, and – even though they, they say pitchers are not athletes, you know, I still think that, you know, in order in the more we're learning in today's world of baseball, um, the way you move and the more athletic you can be on the mound, uh, the more velocity, the more, the more you can be successful. So I, I think you're seeing it now. There's a lot more guys like look at, we got Michael Lorenzen in the big leagues with us. Mm -hmm. That's just a monster. But I mean, you can look across the board and you're just seeing more and more athletic guys on the mound. Even at catching position, you're seeing guys more athletic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which Absolutely. is good for the game. And I mean, matter of fact, the game, you know, Darren, I mean, you're in it. it. The way it's been changing, and I don't know what year it happened, but I know here in Chicago, Joe Madden, you know, had multiple players playing different positions, and they could all do it because very good athletes. It wasn't just two or three guys. It was like seven or eight guys that could move around. Um, and you're seeing more and more teams head to that area, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah, yeah, the, the versatility of a player is uh, prolonging their careers now, you know. Um, there's so much into analytics, but yet just matchups. And, and when you have a guy that can give you uh, multifacets of the game, whether it's, you know, being, a, being able to play up the middle and being a solid defense, even though offense is kind of more important than defense right now, being able to be serviceable up the middle, but yeah, you can put them in a corner outfield spot, you know, 
which allows you to possibly pinch run for the guy in the middle of a, a game instead of having to wait till the end of the game. And it just, it just gives you so many more options if you're a versatile player to, uh, to the manager. Hey, Darren, you mentioned, uh, you know, you recommended, you know, back then when you played, and I'm older than you are, you know, we, uh, you know, multi-sport athletes were important. Would, would you recommend now, especially now, multi-sport athletes under the age of 13? Because some of these travel teams, you know, they're playing baseball all year round, and, and they're not really working on any other sport. Yeah, no. I, I've got twin boys that are uh, nine years old, and they're playing everything. Flag football, they play basketball. They play baseball, uh, but I only keep it to one season. Um, they'll come out with me uh, during the season, so they get to be around the guys and stuff. So they get a little extra there. But, yeah, you, you've got to find out. Don't limit yourself to what you're good at, you know. And there's plenty of time once you develop into your adult body. You're going to figure out what, what you excel at and what you don't. But uh, never pigeonhole a kid so young. You know, since we're talking about your career and all of a sudden, you know, you're in the big leagues and, you know, we might as well jump to this because we could always come back with the coronavirus and, uh, you know, you are you were going to manage and everything. You know, you talk about Maddox, Glab, and Smoltz. You know, everybody knows of Hall of Famers. Um, everybody's seen them pitch. You know, in an era where umpires also had a little wider strike zone going right to left. And, and not, I'm not saying that's, you know, a reason they were good. They were good no matter what. Um, but it's interesting for our coaches in the U.S. and around the world to learn some of the things that you learned from these guys that made you a better pitcher and also a better coach um, in, in baseball. The biggest thing that sticks out to me, there, well, there's, there's two things. One, I always heard from those guys was to simplify the game. You know, whatever situation you're in, just simplify it. Don't overthink anything. Um, and things like that is, you know, I remember Maddox telling me one time, he's like, hey, if you got, if you got uh, six bullets, right, you, you want to make sure that you can command those six bullets. You know, there's no sense in throwing five, six, seven different types of pitches. Be really good at what you're good at. You know, be great at what you're good at. And, and I kind of took that to heart, and it, it took me from throwing five different pitches down to three mm. to make sure that I was really good with those three and then, and then branch out, if I could, just for more of show-me type pitches. And the other thing was, you know, always look, and I struggle with this today with, with a lot of our pitchers. Um, when they have a bad game, the first thing they want to do is go look at video and see what went wrong or whatever. Um, I always look at, and, and I got this from these guys, because we would watch video back then. It wasn't anything. It was actually like the cassette tapes, and you yeah. had a little reel, and you reeled it back, and, you, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But they always say, say, go and make adjustments to what you were really bad at that day. And some days on your bad games, you were really bad at being good. <laughs> so go look at the things that you did well so that you can repeat those over and over again, you know, and, and, and that just kind of stuck at me. He's like, okay, it's easy to pitch when you're really good. And those mm -hmm. days when you have command of everything, but those days when you're bad, don't go look at what you did bad. That's just stick in your mind. Go and look at the video of what you were doing well that game so that you can re improve on that and keep moving forward and progressing instead of regressing. And, and what you were doing good could be that you were sticking to your best pitches to try to get you out of it, or you were battling just being, you know, tough and, and not giving up. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there, there could have been, like for me, the, uh, the breaking ball was my third pitch, you know, but hey, maybe I was throwing that one actually well and my changeup was a little flat and I wasn't able to get my fastball inside to lock guys up, whatever it was. But I can go back to that breaking ball. It's like, hey, man, I've been working on that. I finally saw some success. Let's build off of that. Don't worry about what happened and keep, keep progressing. Now, I'm going to use the word attention to detail. I'll tell you why. I was in uh, spring training, I don't know, 1999 with Atlanta. Um, I was an international coach at the time. And Bill Clark, a big time, you know, scout for the Reds internationally, brought in yep. all these international people. So we got a chance to go and watch uh, Maddox at that time in the bullpen. And, man, every time he threw a pitch in a bullpen, he'd always look down. And if his foot wasn't in that same spot, and I know that's going back then, you know, maybe things have changed, but it, he would be upset. It was, uh, you know, they were, they were, his attention to little minor details was big. Oh, absolutely. And, that, and that's the thing. It's like it, it, it may sound like you're, you're overanalyzing, but it is. It's, it's just being simple. He's not worried. On a day like that, when you saw him, he's probably what we call working over the rubber and not over the plate. 
Mm. So in other words, he's working on the delivery portion of it, not really worrying where the ball's going. Yeah. And then there could be another day when he's actually worrying about the action of the pitcher at the plate and not really worrying about his delivery, you know, so that, you know, it's just a separation of the two. Um, but it's simplifying it instead of going into a bullpen and going, man, that, that, I, that pitch didn't break the way I wanted it to. Now I'm going to try to change this and this and my delivery. You know, which one are you working on? You're working on the actual pitch or you're working on your delivery? Simplify it, separate the two, and, and just have a game plan. You know, it's interesting because, uh, listen, our coaches out there, I'm sure you've gone through this. You know, I remember telling players, okay, let's work on your movement. Don't worry what happens to the ball right? Yeah. You know, worry about your movement patterns right now, your work that you're doing. Now, the other thing you mentioned was, um, you know, guys would go to video um, sometimes, and it seems like some players, when players come to you, when, they're not, when they have a bad day, it's, they, always th they always think it's a mechanical issue. Yeah. It's not always that. No, no, it's not always. I mean, sometimes you got to tip your head. I mean, there's a guy with a, a bat 60 feet, six inches away that is trying to make money too, and, <laughs> and sometimes they just get you. You got you to kind of that's why I always tell the guy, don't go straight to it after the game. Give it a day. We'll get to the yard early the next day. And let, let's give a chance to just kind of soak it in and analyze what's going on here. Because sometimes you were actually executing pitches. The guy just beat you, you know, and that's just part of the game, you know. And that's hard. It's a hard pill to swallow sometimes. But when you get in that mindset, um, I think it keeps you out of them big peaks and valleys. In your uh, throughout a season, you kind of stay more even keel and more consistent through the year. For our young coaches out there, let me throw this at you. You got young kids or possibly, you know, sooner or later going to start pitching or maybe they are pitching. Um, where do you start with them with types of pitches? Um, you know, obviously you want to make sure that their, their movements and patterns are real good. They can control their body. But where do you st when you start with pitches, what's the progression that you might use with the pitches? Well, first and foremost, all I, well, I, like I said, I got, I got twin boys that are nine years old and, you know, they get, I, they don't pitch, but the kids I help on their team. And all I tell is say, you just got to play catch. If you want to be a successful pitcher, you got to be really good at playing catch, plain and simple. Whether you're throwing it to the catcher or the catcher's got to throw it back to you. You start throwing that snowball around and, and guys just run around the bases and that's no fun, you know? So from there, it, it's just, being able to consistently throw strikes, you know, and, and playing a game with kids, they don't have to worry about throwing the ball hard at a young level. They just need to learn how the game's played, enjoy being up there, you know, make them realize, man, they're the only person in any sport that's raised above the ground when they're playing, right? Yeah. You're up on a hill. Everybody's looking at you, man. Yeah. I mean, you're the dude, you know, yeah. and just kind of have fun with them. Make it, make it feel special when they get a chance to be up there. And then, you know, as, as you start to see him develop and get a little bit stronger, um, you know, you, you can start to move the fastball around or you add another finger to the fastball, you know, and that takes a little bit off, you know. Friction does amazing things. And that's the biggest thing we do with our, our uh, pro guys right now is a lot of these kids have never, like, toyed with different types of grips. They just always grab the fastball this way and that's it, you know. So you can play with the, that type of pitch without – really introducing the breaking ball or, you know, I'd go fastball to change up before you go to the breaking ball, but it's, it's all about, you know, looking at a kid, understanding where he is and making sure that you're putting them in a place to succeed. You know, if you, if you teach a kid a breaking ball too young and then all of a sudden he just, it's a cool pitch. So he wants to throw it and throw it. And all of a sudden he's walking the world and his teammates are sitting out there picking flowers in the outfield because the game's That's just not, not fun. Done. It's no fun, you know. You just want to set them up for some success. Absolutely. You know, and that's probably the hardest thing to do. And that, that's why to get your advice, I think, is very important. Hardest thing to do is for young pitchers, at even high school level or travel ball or, you know, um, is to understand that you can get guys out with your fastball if you locate it well in different areas. It's amazing watching big league guys when they locate a fastball in the right spot and it's only 88 miles an hour or 87, they're able – to get the guy to swing and miss because of the location. Yeah, location and movement, man. And it's slowly trending back to that, you know, because it's all been about velocity probably for the last five years, right? Mm -hmm. and every guy that comes out of the bullpen in the big leagues is 97 plus and, you know, and now they're working on spin so that they can pitch at the top of the zone, things like that. But you're starting to see a little bit more success. Look at, you know, Keiko for, you know, just watching him throw the other day against us. You know, and he's 
88, 89, 90, you know, and he's just, he's starting to kind of bend the ball a little bit and changing speeds, you know, so that even though there's an emphasis on a particular portion of, the, of pitching right now, you still, you know, there's still room for all those other pitchers that are able, you know, may not have been blessed with that 95 plus fastball. You can learn to move the ball around and change speeds and be an intelligent pitcher on the mound. End game is getting outs, you know, whether you want to fight it all you want, you, you got to get three outs and get your butt off the mound so your team can hit. Yeah, and love that's coming from you. And a shout-out to uh, the Reds and Derek Johnson also. You know, the Reds are not the team that I would want to be playing in the playoffs right now. <laughs> um, you know, at early on, we thought, ah, the Reds aren't going to make it. But that's not the team because, man, that pitching and that lineup coming around, wow, look out. Um, talk about Glavin and Smoltz. You know, is there other things that you've taken from those guys that into your, into your coaching career? Um. <laughs> yeah, actually, when you're away from the mount or away from the field, you're away from the field. Like, I remember in uh, 99, when I was slotted to be the fifth starter, I got a call from Glavin uh, about two weeks before spring training to make sure I was bringing my golf clubs. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> bring my golf clubs all the time. I played 36 rounds of golf with those guys in one spring training. Wow. So if you're slotted as that fifth starter, right, well, you're starting that game. There's your foursome. So every day that you were not on the mound pitching a spring training game, you were playing golf and you had your foursome and we, we would play all the time. Um, but it was, if you watch them play golf, like just the way that they, they go about their business every day is just very simple, very basic, almost bore you to death. And um, I, I, I try to take that to these kids now because right now they're getting so much information thrown at them with all this new technology, mm -hmm. all this data and everything, which is great because I, you know, I really wish I'd have had some of this stuff back when I was throwing, but you've got to be able to process it and then get on the mound and trust the heartbeat and just, and just play the game, you know? Um, and, the, and that's what I'm talking about. It's just, you just got to simplify and kind of separate the two when it's time, take the information when you can get it, and apply what you can actually do when you're between the lines. And between those lines, when you talk about, you know, Glavin, Maddox, Smoltz, or anybody else, or your pitchers that you have on, on your staff, um, what are the, I guess, the things that you see that make them successful? Um, why are they different than somebody else? Like you mentioned breathing. You mentioned, you know, controlling the strike zone. Are those things that make them better pitchers than someone else? Um. I think honestly, with this new data, that you're you're able to kind of pinpoint or like we say, we'll we'll bucket pitchers, right? So, you know, you may be a guy that that's a high spin guy now. You know, we talk about you know um, spin rate. Well, that may be your thing. Well, just because you're not that guy, you may be a guy that um, that sinks the ball or can pronate very well. Okay, so now we play off of that. Uh -huh. It's being able to identify what you are, the type of pitch you are. And like, you know, DJ says this a lot too. He's like, whatever you're good at, be great at. So find out what it is. And, and like I said, this information that we've got nowadays is really, really useful to identify what you're good at. Now take what you're good at and be great at it. You know, don't try to do something that's out of your realm or, you know, your body may not work this way or your hand doesn't get on top to be more of a forcing guy. You, you just got to be able to analyze yourself and then, and then do what you do really good. You know, and that's one thing you're hearing more and more in the coaching realm, you know, teach according to what their strengths are. Um, and I love to hear that. Now, uh, off the air, we were talking about a couple of things and interesting, I thought would be to bring up. One of the things that, um, you know, you were going to manage in 2020, and unfortunately because of the coronavirus, that's not happening. But you also played for some really good managers um, and Riggleman being one. And it's always interesting to learn what makes a good manager, you know, as a player, you saw him. Um, and so not only him, but anybody else that you manage for, what makes the quality of a good manager that you would recommend coaches looking into to becoming better? Good managers, I think, uh, build a relationship, like a one-on-one -on -one relationship with each one of the players. Um, you know, coming up in Atlanta and I had Bobby Cox. Oh, you know, yeah. And they always said Bobby Cox was the, uh, there's another Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, that he was always a player's coach. 
And the reason that is, is, you know, I remember my debut and I didn't know it at the time while I was pitching, but I went back and watched the video later and man, he is fighting for every pitch that I throw. You know, I said, granted, I'm not glabbing up there, so I'm not getting those four or five, six inches off the plate, right. <laughs> you know, but you know, he, you could see him in the dugout, just, just fighting for me. And, and that's, that's how you build those relationships and, and, and getting those players to actually do anything and everything for you to be successful as a manager. So um, Riggleman, you know, in 2018, I was on the major league staff with Cincinnati and, and I got to sit there and watch him for a year, just kind of, um, you know, we didn't have the best roster, you know, the best uh, season, but the way he would manage and the way he would analyze a game and, you know, he just thinks out of the box and he looks for ways to take advantage that, that you wouldn't normally traditionally see. And then in the clubhouse and, and he makes it a point to just walk around, whether it's in the, in the lunchroom or in the locker room, in the training room, whatever he goes through and, and he makes sure he, he has a conversation with each player, whether it's position player or a uh, pitcher every day, you know, whether it's walking in the outfield during batting practice, he makes sure he says hello and has a meaningful conversation with every guy. And I think that's that's huge on building trust so that when you get into the battle that uh, and you, you have to make a change. You take one guy out of the game and, and, and you insert somebody else, that guy that got taken out has more of an understanding. He's just not pissed off for the next three days. You know, and it's interesting because, you know, sometimes you're a player's manager. And I know some people might think, oh, they, he just lets you do whatever you want to do. That's not the case, obviously. No. These are these are quality people. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to the managing aspect of it, you know, and the pitching, you know, the manager comes out to take you out, um, you know, kind of address how that works, you know, because, you know, it's an intense game. I mean, guys are trying to win, guys are trying to, you know, do well for their jobs, you know, it's money that they're making, it's a career. I mean, sure, they want to win only, but it's also their career. So what does that look like when a manager comes out? Um, how do managers deal with certain situations? That, that all falls back on that relationship. And you kind of know the, uh, the uh, persona of that, of that pitcher that's on the mound. And everybody's different. You know, there's guys that are just so over the top intense that you just pretty much take the ball and, and, and let them walk off the mound. <laughs> yeah. And then, the, and then there's guys that, you know, kind of borderline struggling they could they either could have gone really bad or you know they're one pitch away from having a decent outing and, and you could sit out there and kind of have that quick little conversation before you take the ball from them and then you know uh, ask for the guy in the bullpen but um, it's, it's all it's all going to be that feel of that manager when you walk out there and you know is that guy making eye contact with you you know I, I've had it because I was doing it in spring training and you know you you go out there and take a picture and I was the same way too. I'd stare my manager down. I was like, don't you point to that <laughs> bullpen. You know, I want to stay in here type thing, but you understand as, as a pitcher, you know, the, the situation of the game, but as a competitor, you never want to get taken out. Absolutely. Um, what about you now when, when a pitcher has a bad day um, and he comes out, what's that conversation like? When does that conversation take place? You know, um, guy just gave up three, four runs, you know, I, you know, and again, advice to other coaches and how to handle young people when it comes to this. I like to have a conversation, whether I was the pitching coach or the manager, I, before he took off back to whether he had to go do his shoulder program or whatever. Um, I like to have a little conversation with him. One, to just kind of a mental check to see where he's at. Um, but two, you know, point out, like I said, you've got to set them up for success. You've got to point out things that they did well because they're just going to focus on everything negative when they came out of a bad situation um, and just give them something like that to think of when they go out and go in into the clubhouse and do whatever they got to do. But uh, for me, it was always kind of more of a mental check. Once they, once they got a chance, toweled off, got a drink or whatever, inning ended, they're getting ready to head in. I try to have that, that mental check conversation with them. And then, if it's a mechanical issue that you had, maybe you saw during the game or on video, uh, kind of run us through how that conversation goes and then the work that they do in the, you know, on the next day or the day after that. Yeah. So what I was, I always take notes during the game, you know, so if I see something mechanical, whether, you know, front side's flying open, he, he's blocking off his lead leg, whatever it is, you know, I'll take notes of it, but to make sure that I'm seeing what I think I see, 
after the game when everybody's gone or, you know, on our computers, I can pull up all of our live feeds and, and I'll go through and I'll look at it. And if it's exactly what I, what I saw, um, if it, if it's something simple that I don't have to do on the mound and wait for the guy's bullpen two days from now or whatever it was, sometimes I'll text the kid, you know, we're, we're on the road and he's in the hotel or he went to go get something to eat. You know, I'll send him a video of what I saw. You know, so that it's in his mind. I'm like, okay, when we get here tomorrow, we're going to do these drills so that we can just reemphasize the correction we need to make within that delivery. Um, but most of the times I would say, you know, you wait until the bullpen and you always have a plan when you go into the bullpen. Don't just let the kid go in there and just throw to throw, even if he had a really good game. You know, he threw seven scoreless, two, you know, two hits, ten punchies, whatever it was always have a plan for them, you know, so that they don't get complacent at where they are, you know, because he, especially if you're in the minor leagues, you get complacent, your, your career is going to end really quick. In the big leagues, some guys get complacent and you got to tell, you know, you got to keep pushing them. I'm like, Hey, you're not that Cy Young award winner. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, you got one. Let's get a second one. You know, you always just got to make sure that they're motivated. So you give them a game plan going into each bullpen. Don't let, we're not like hitters, you know, they, we can't go in the cage and take 500 swings every day. You know, we take our bullpens, you got that 20, 30 pitches, you got to make them count, you know, so have a purpose behind each one of them, make sure you're getting the most out of each. So each, each pitcher is going to have that plan going in and folks, obviously you got to stick to 20, 30 because you, you know, like you said, hitting, you, you're going to hurt somebody if you're going to throw way too much in a bullpen. Um, so that conversation that plan, excuse me, that goes into the bullpen. Because you notice bullpens seem to be different nowadays than they were before. Um, sometimes they're even competitive. Are there the Reds yeah. in that area also? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We have uh, – I know they're doing it because we don't have a minor league season this year. But right. up there uh, in the big leagues and at our alternate site, you know, they, we do like king of, the, king of the hill, you know. And there's a sheet, you know, and you're checking off every box that you hit, whether, you know, you're trying to locate fastball up and away. Then you got to go, you know, and there's a, a program, you know, fastball up and away, fastball uh, up and in. Then you're going to go breaking ball or change up low. And you're trying to mark off each box, right? And the guy coming in after you is going to do the exact same thing. You be able to talk a little smack with them, whoever won. Yeah. You got to keep those competitive juices flowing, right? Um, and and every, And there's certain situations. Sometimes, you know, you're in there for a different purpose to actually work on one particular thing. Okay, it may not be that competitive day, but you've got to mix in uh, competition because I think competition breeds success. In my, you know, and, and the old adage of success will breed success. If one guy starts succeeding, you're going to see it's going to fall through your entire rotation if there's competition built in between themselves. You know, I'm thinking for our college, high school kids. Here's another area. Um, you know, prior to a game, a starter getting ready. Um, you know, the routine is important, you know, and I'm assuming how many pitches he throws. Is he prepared for that first inning or is he still getting ready in the first inning, unfortunately? What does that look like? I know it's a broad question because every pitcher is different. But in general, what does that look like uh, prior to a game? That last couple of years, you know, when I was uh, doing rookie ball, and you have a lot of the younger Latin kids. You know, you mm -hmm. got kids with great arms, but they, they've never really been through a season yet, right? So for me, it took me two to three starts to figure out these kids. Some of them, just like you said, they think they're warm in the bullpen and then you go watch them throw in the first <laughs> inning and they're all below the map, you know? Yeah. Um, so then you talk to them after that start and say, okay, we're, we're going to program this thing out, you know? And I have them write out what their pregame routine is from the moment. When are you walking through that clubhouse door? Seven mm -hmm. o'clock start. Are you walking in at five o'clock? Okay, from 5 to 5.30, you just kind of relax, kind of get acclimated. 5.30, are you in the training room getting loose? You know, when are you going to step out onto the field? When are you going to start your stretching? Do you do any stretching in the clubhouse? What's your throwing program like? Are you going to use any of the plyo balls? Are you going to use any of the heavy balls? Are you going to extend out to 300 feet? You're only going to go 250, whatever it is. I want them to write it down. And then, I, you know, the first couple outings, I'll sit there and I'll stopwatch everything to make sure and write it down. So we figure out, okay, your warm-up routine is actually 44, 45 minutes where you're getting out there 30 minutes before game time. And then all of a sudden you're not loose until inning two, you know, wow. but being able to kind of, 
like you said, everything's kind of programmed. You got to individualize everything, you know, and, and that's the one thing I think that baseball has done a really good job of in this era is it's becoming more and more individualized. Um, for me coming up with Atlanta and I remember the first two years I was in big league camp, you know, my locker was right next to Glavin, you know, and that was the way I learned. I, I watched him. Yeah. I was left-handed. We looked exactly the same. <laughs> Funny thing is my, on my debut, uh, Glavin had thrown opening day Maddox through day two. And I came in behind Maddox and threw three innings. And then the next day I get a whole stack of photos from my debut and I'm thumbing through them and Glav had his from opening day and we're thumbing through them. And the team photographer had like shuffled the pictures of the two of us, put them together and just split them and we couldn't tell who was who. Wow. I mean, that's because I, I had, st when I was coming up in the minor leagues, I was not allowed to pitch on the day Glavin pitched. I had to chart Glavin's games on TBS, not our minor league games that I should have been you know, Plus, so, if, if you were very similar, they wouldn't want you to pitch on the same day, correct? Yeah, no. So that, that I would be watching him. and I wa So I knew exactly how he got every hitter out in the big leagues. You wow. know? So it was, I was groomed that way. But this is what I'm talking about. Was that the best for me? Probably at the time, yeah. But now with the way technology is and the information and stuff we got, you can get much more individualized. And I think, and I think that helps a lot. But when it comes down to it, there's still that heartbeat and you, you got to be able to execute and, and get those three outs. You know, another difficult thing sometimes for young players is when they're in that bullpen or when they're warming up prior to the game, you've got so many pitches to throw, you know, in that bullpen. Um, how do you pick, I guess the question is, how do you pick which pitches you're going to throw? Because you might be a three or four pitch pitcher. Um, and how do you know which one to work on? So you're ready for the ball game. You got to prioritize them. Um, and a lot of time, you know, you've got to know what your, your out pitch is, what your number, your best secondary pitch is, and you got to work from there. So, you know, it, it's locate the fastball, you know, your, your arm's going to get loose, even though you're not, you may be a, a 92, 93 guy, you know, you're warming up in the bullpen and you're 87, 88. That's perfectly fine for me. I want you locating the more you can control the adrenaline in a bullpen, the more you'll control it when you're in the game, because that adrenaline is going to kick up in a game. And if you can control that heartbeat, you're going to stay within yourself, within your delivery and not get out of control, trying to get a little too fast, flying open, falling off the mound, all those different things when you can control it in the bullpen. So I'm all, all about staying calm, staying relaxed, not giving your best bullet until maybe your last two or three you know, before you walk off that mound, you know, and then, like I said, you go from that and I go to my first best secondary pitch for my best secondary pitch. I go to the next one, the one that I can throw for a first pitch strike. Now, if you've got a fourth and a fifth one, you know, th those are probably projects that are, you know, unless you're pitching in the big leagues and you're a number one starter, most of the times those are projects that you're working at and you find, and you almost have that game plan of, okay, this is a hitter. I can try this pitch on. You know, he struggles with, you know, I'm working on my slider. I've always been a curveball guy. I'm trying to make it into a slider. All right, this guy struggles with sliders. This is your opportunity to use it. And then kind of have a game plan for those fourth and fifth pitches. But you got to compete and you never want to get beat unless you're using your, your, your number one and number two. Great point. So that means one and two, and again, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, one and two, you're throwing – Let's take the lineup. You're starting with those possibly. You're not showing your next one till later, nope. but that could change. The plan could change midstream if all of a sudden you're struggling with one of those first two pitches. Oh, yeah. That, that plan could change in the first inning. In a heartbeat. You know, <laughs> I, I, I always tried to. I always tried to go get through the lineup, uh, just fastball change up if I could, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but there's situation, you know, first guy – you know, flares one over the first baseman's head, and all of a sudden it's man on second. You know, it's fast guy, man on second, nobody out. You know what? I'm going to throw that hammer and get myself out of this situation. You know, you got to adjust the plan. I can probably go back to it after I get out of that and try to go fastball change up, fastball change up, or whatever that game plan is. But uh, when you're between the lines, and this is the thing, even at the minor league level, um, when you're between the lines, you can't substitute competing and those guys need to learn to compete that's just as big as any other developmental tool you want guys that are competitors up on the mound 
if they get too involved in in working on a certain pitch or like we talk about pitch design and stuff now um that stuff's for bullpens that stuff's for in between your starts when you're between those lines you want to give them the mindset that they're competing and they're trying to beat the you know what out of the guy that's in that box right there you know the other area i was thinking you've seen more and more now, i don't know how many but it seems like more and more at least from television and i don't know if it's because of the short season but uh, pitchers going from the stretch, um, maybe they're more comfortable or also, you know, because if a runner gets on, now they're at least used to that right away instead of getting used to it. Are those areas, uh, is that why pitchers are doing that? Yeah, to an extent. Um, I used to say it's a cop out, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it, uh, it simplifies the delivery um, with as much um, – technology that we're using and the way that we're trying to move our bodies as pitchers now um, everything's trying to get more compact not as much long lanky it's more of a shorter backswing mm -hmm. or shorter arm swing on the backside so that we can get to pronation a little a little sooner or get behind the ball guys that cut the ball a lot well th there's so many different things that they're trying to simplify now but i i think there's there's that fine line where you got to you got to look at deception too. You know, when you try to, when you try to make everybody look exactly the same, it makes a lot easier for hitters to, to pick up the ball, you know? So you, you don't want to take the, the unique look and the feel and the style of a pitcher. You want to let them be themselves and work from within that frame that they have. You know, you mentioned heartbeat and I wrote a note on just heartbeat because I have no idea. I'm thinking outside the box here. Um, do we have tech, you know, cause I've, I've seen a lot of technology. Do we have technology that controls, not controls, but looks at the heartbeat of pitcher in a bullpen and in a game so we can yep. train them to train that heartbeat. Yep. There's guys that are wearing sensors and, uh, and they'll, they'll look at it and it's able to tell you through your breathing, you know, whether, you know, are you, wow. are you at full oxygen when you're actually releasing the pitch? Have you already kind of released your your oxygen before that you've released the ball, you know, just, this is, <laughs> this is a scientist, like they call it the mad scientist at times, you know, but yeah. like, it, it's very interesting. You know, I, I love learning about the stuff um, and whatever can help a player improve. I'm all in on, you know, so there is, there's all these kind of things that, that are done now to, uh, to try to perfect what a certain pitcher does but like i said it's just the big thing is to stay within what that pitcher has and let him be himself and then work within that framework well it makes so much sense if you've got technology and we're talking about breathing so important we talk about vision being so important and vision is important in pitching hitting you know and we have the technology to train these two areas why not use them you know it's crazy yeah. when people say well technology you know we don't need it in the old days we didn't have it i get it but man it can make you so much better and i'm thinking you know i'm looking back you look at maddox again schmoltz and glavin um and now we use the big word all the time tunneling but you know when you look at those three their release point i don't even have to use video but i'm guessing their release point was as close as it can be on all their pitches. Oh. So talk about how important we are, you know, in the era of tunneling, how critical that is. Yeah, tunneling has been around ever since I got into the game in yeah. the mid nineties, you know? Um, so, but it's, it's just now the technology, you're actually able to track it. Mm. You know, we, we could see, and we would sit and watch. It was always a thing with, with starters that every starter would watch every other starters bullpen. So as a group, guys would stand behind and you would watch and you'd be able to watch actions of pitches. Are you tunneling it? Is your breaking ball popping out? Are you able to keep it on that fastball plane for a later break, you know? Uh, but just the ability now to actually use a rap soto machine or use track man and actually be able to see the flight of the ball and see how they tunnel and separate and at what distance they separate from home plate. Can you keep them tunneling longer you know, and, and all this information is great. Um, it's just how you utilize it and, and, and being able to make adjustments off of that information. Yeah, and you hear a lot about spin rate, and I'm sure people also there are thinking, well, okay, it's great that it spins, but if you think about it, if I've got a curveball and I've got a, you know, a lot, if I can increase my spin on that curveball, it looks like a fastball and then drops, I mean, that's just an advantage for me. Sure, I can keep trying to do it, but if I see those numbers that they're changing, you know, 
big league guys, pro guys are no different than kids um, or college guys. They all want to progress and, they, and using technology is fun also. That's the other thing with young kids. You could use technology. You don't have to use it a lot, but it's fun for young kids. It keeps their attention. So why not use it? And you can, you can progress and, and look that I'm actually getting better at this. Yeah. Yeah. It, with today's uh, generation, you know, it becomes more like a video game to them. And that, that's sometimes the hurdle that you got to get over is we'll have the Rapsodo machine and you have the iPad sitting right there in the bullpen. And we are, we're, we're working on pitch shaping or pitch design, right? So, I, we're, you know, we're trying to get the axis of the breaking ball. He spins it well, but he's too much on the side. And we want to try to tilt that thing up so it's more of a true uh, 12 six, which there is no such thing as 12 six anymore, but as close to 12 six as we can. Um, but is, that a bad, time, is, is that a bad thing or a good thing? No, it, it's like I said, it all depends on what, what you're trying to do with the pitch and what you're matching it up. If it's a high spin guy who's got, you know, some velocity and he can pitch up in the zone, you want that 12 six, mm. you know, if you got a guy that's kind of more side spin, you know, he may be at one o'clock or, or one thirty. And he rides that ball arm side. Well, now you want that breaking ball to kind of match that in the other direction, because if we're tunneling, we're trying to stay here and then split the two. Right. Um, So, like I said, you stay within the framework of the pitcher. And I'll never say one thing's worse over the other. They'll work. You just got to you just got to make sure you're matching the pitches up together. Love it. Now, I I don't know. Again, I'm older, but back when I played, I'm trying to think. I don't know because I wasn't a pitcher, but now you hear more guys talking about not just coaches, but also some players, even on MLB Network, I've seen it, where, you know, if you're throwing a four-seam fastball, they try to throw a four-seam changeup, so they're trying to keep the same rotation. Has that always been like that, or is that something new? Always. I, when I first time I was in big league camp, you know, and I, I wasn't a changeup guy at the very beginning, but when I got to big league camp, and like I said, they, all the starters watch each other, and Glavin was watching me. And he saw that I was, I threw two seam fastballs, but then I threw a four seam changeup and he's asking me why. Uh-huh. And I, I was like, I don't know. I've always gripped it this way. <laughs> you know, he's like hit or see spin, match that spin of that changeup, you know? And, and that's the thing now, you know, you're just talking about tunneling. We're doing, we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to be not as deceptive in our delivery, but as deceptive as we can with our pitches so that two pitches look the same. Now, I'm familiar with, with Derek Johnson. Obviously, we follow Kyle Bodie a lot, too. Um, a lot of people do. And um, I've been with Tom House for over 30 years, doing a lot of stuff in the past. And, you know, one of the things you – I think you're seeing more and more is when you start your delivery, keep it going. Um, don't slow it down. I mean, I think Bauer would probably be one of the greatest examples of that. Um, you know, get it and go. Don't slow down anywhere in your motion. Is that on the right track? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it, we've always talked about momentum, right? But we talk about more of the direction of momentum. They're more about just, like you said, from start to go and, and keeping that pace and gaining speed throughout the delivery. Yeah, because in uh, the old days, I'm sorry, in the old days, they yeah. used to say, well, you're rushing, now your arm's led behind. And now science has shown us that's really not the fact. Yeah, well, also what we're trying to, what kind of the trend is right now is a lot of people, you look at Bauer, you look at, uh, Giolito. Giolito, like, I was going to bring up. He changed his arm. He changed the, the arm swing on the back. In order <laughs> to be quicker to the plate, you've got to change something on the back because that is still true. You still could be late. If mm. you've got a long delivery on the, on the arm swing on the oh, back yeah. side, but you're quick, you're going to be late. Yeah. Your body, the human so, body. Sorry, sorry yep. Darren, I apologize. Um, so, I'm, so I understand it also because it could be a question. So as my delivery is going quicker – Obviously, my arm action is going to be different. If it's long, then you could still drag it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, and your arm's going to go quicker if you move forward because it, that's what I was going to say. The way the human body works is, you know, if I'm fast on my front side, my back side's going to be fast too. It's tough to move one half of my body fast and the other half slow. It's like the whole pat and rub thing, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it's tough to do. So your body's going to adjust to whatever tempo you have. But now, because we're trying to rush, you've got to kind of get that, that circle on the backside a little bit shorter and quicker to get up top so that you've got that momentum and your arm's still in the right spot for delivery. Love it. Love it. Um, the other area, I guess, you know, we can, we can talk about a little bit is when um, 
and I'm trying to think of, I had a thought because sometimes when I get a thought, I really want to stay with it. Um, it could be a question that coaches have, but on the delivery, is there anything else that pitchers can do to, I guess, deceive the hitter um, in some ways? You know, and I'm getting at, you know, you see guys sometimes that release the ball real early, some guys later, the guys later. Yeah, well, yeah later. like you're seeing more and more of these quick pitches, right? Mm -hmm. um, you yeah, very stopping and going. Rarely, yeah, you very rarely see it. Or you got the Johnny Cuatos that kind of hang up right. and do a little shimmy before. That, that's all great as long as you're athletic enough to be able to repeat the delivery. Right. You still need to be on time. I don't care what you do. It's the same thing when, you know, our hitting coaches are working with their hitters. Guys start with their hands all over the place. But once you got front foot contact, mm -hmm. that heel gets down. Those hands are always in the same spot. The bat angle may be a little different depending on the hitter, but those hands are ready and loaded. So whatever you're doing, whether you're if you're quick pitching, you know, you got to get you got to separate those hands out of that glove quick. If you're gonna hold, you gotta make sure that when you do make your move to the plate, you gotta get that hand working, you know? So the deception's there, but you can wipe all that away just knowing that at the delivery point, at the release, you've gotta be on time every time. And boy, you better practice it. Uh, yeah. You better not, it better not be the first time you do it on the mound or you're really <laughs> gonna mess, mess yourself up. You know, the other thing is, you know, it, it's not talked about a lot, um, but, Pickoffs, and, and I, we don't need to go through all the pickoffs, but I, the question on pickoffs would be, you know, with, um, you know, obviously kids need to practice them, but it seems like they always pick after they set, but you don't have to pick after you set all the no. time. Um, no. Nope. Kind of go over that briefly. Do you give some coaches an idea there for kids? For us, um, that, that comes into uh, kind of a pregame report that you get. And you, you get reports on how guys take their leads. Some guys don't take their leads until after you've gotten your sign. And as you're coming up, they're taking their leads. Some guys have already jumped out because they're trying to steal signs. So they want to get out early. So they're looking, right? So you've got to know what type of base runner that's out there and which one's going to be more effective. Um, when you know you've got a guy that, that doesn't start his lead until you start coming up to your set position, those are the, for me, those are the easiest guys to get picked off. Right-handed, left-handed, doesn't matter. But that, that's part of the pregame, you know, reports. You know, are you doing your homework? You know, I love that because you always hear the perspective of just pick, working on your pickups, but you really never hear you're, you're working on your pickups according to the runner um, and, and, and their habits. That's fantastic. Love it. Uh, the other part, okay, a couple things because, and then I want to jump in the money ball to finish it off. Um, first of all, we talked about, you know, some uh, pitch sequence or, you know, ton and all that stuff. Is there anything else in, in, that you wanted to mention to our coaches, player, and parents about that area there? Anything else we might've missed for now? The, you know, I, I work with a lot of high school kids out here as well. And, you know, so for some of the younger kids, and I know everything's velocity, velocity, velocity right now. Mm -hmm. um, utilize this technology when you're trying to, to find a college to get into. You don't have to be that 90, 95 guy because you're probably going to get drafted if you are, right? But if you're trying to get into college and, you know, and get yourself a scholarship, if you learn how, how to use some of this technology, like a rap soto, and, and you can spin the ball very well, you may be 85, 84 mile an hour fastball, but you spin the ball well, you got good spin efficiency, your access is good, your secondary pitches play off of it. You're just not in your adult body and you're not strong enough yet. You can take that information and use that as a recruiting tool with colleges. I, I get college coaches that I talk to a lot wow. about it because I get some of the kids on, on the machine and I tell them, it's like, hey, this guy, you know, he, he may be throwing 84, but he's got 2,500 spin rate and he's over 95%. I said, all you do is got to get him in a weight room, let him grow for a couple more years. You're going to have a, you know, a high spin guy who's, you know, 93, 94 in about three years, you know, so you're, you can use that stuff now, not thinking that you have to throw hard right now, because some guys don't develop until late. So there's some information out there that if you can get into uh, facilities that have it, or you know somebody you know that can, that can get you kind of tracked on some of this information, it's a great rec recruiting tool. You know what? And I'm thinking, yes, of course, because what do most kids do? They're told to send a video in. 
Um, yep. But, you know, the videos, everybody's sending the video in. Here's a great another area of technology that they can use. And I'm thinking about this. I remember being in Europe and they said, well, you know, we're not, we don't throw this certain velocity. And, you know, obviously they're all studying now, you know, the heavy, the weighted balls and all these programs. Yep. But, you know, I remember telling them, okay, you may not throw, maybe you're throwing 86, but if your changeup is 12 miles an hour slower um, and you could work on that part, because maybe you don't know how to work on the velocity yet, at least that big difference gives yeah. you a big advantage, no? Speed differential. Yeah. yeah. We talk about it all the time, you know. Um, it's easy for hitters to adjust when that pitch is within eight miles an hour. That's kind of the uh, the uh, mm. the ticket zone, you know. If your mm -hmm. fastball is 90, but your, your changeup's 82, and you're bubbling on that, we try to get that set speed differential. Because the more you can do that with the same arm speed without slowing down, that's where you get your swings and misses. You know, and I mentioned that because I just saw Crockett here in Chicago, White Sox. I believe I named them right. Yeah. Left-handed pitcher, 101 yeah. fastball, 88 changeup. You know, I mean, I mean, coming at you, unbelievable. And he's tall and he's big and he's coming at you. That's the kid that just came out of the draft this year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, hadn't played. I don't even think he's even played maybe a year pro ball. Yeah, he's been even. at the, uh, the alternate site the entire time. Yeah, exactly. And he's already thrown, you know, like two innings of, you know, shutout ball in relief. <laughs> um, you know, and the Reds, unfortunately, I think it was the Reds. Might have been, and I don't want to say it was the Reds, but it was one of the teams that you could tell they haven't seen this guy. They have no reports on him. So, they were having trouble right away just picking up the ball because they had no clue who this guy was. Yeah. Yep. And that's the thing. It's like, at least when the kids are in the minor leagues and they come up, you know, we have that advanced yeah. report. So you, you've got an idea of at least what he throws. You got nothing because he was hiding at the alternate site for the, well, for the past few weeks. And that goes to show how important advanced scouting is. I know they're getting rid of scouts. I see more and more teams doing it. It's a shame. Um, you know, I hope, I, I think like you said earlier, you said something about, you know, things are coming around. I think a lot of things are going to come around back to where, not totally where it used to be, but yeah. kind of balanced. Exactly. That's the big thing. It, it'll get back to center, hopefully. Yeah. You know, because like I said, we are losing a lot, in my opinion, a lot of really good baseball people right now. I agree. Uh, and, it, you know, with the way COVID went this year, and I know a lot of teams are – uh, scaling back a little bit. And then on the minor league side, every team is losing one to two minor league teams. We're we'll getting short season minor league baseball next year. What about all, all those coaches season. too? Yeah. So we're, you, there is, you know, you're reading it in the uh, online and on the uh, MLB uh, rumor reports or whatever, you know, you just hear all the time of organizations having to let people go, you know, and a lot of them friends of mine, but it, it's, it's just good baseball people. And like you said, it's, it's going to, it's going to flip around where you're going to have all this technology. And then now you're going to have to say, how do I relate this to the kids? Yeah, I agree. And I think even in the game itself, because I'm sure you might agree with this, you know, especially for young kids, the game is, can be boring, can be slow and boring, right? That's why that's one challenge you have about getting kids to play the game longer. Um, Cause they find other things to do that are a little bit more exciting. You watch major league baseball it's slowed down a little bit because, you know, a lot of strikeouts, a lot of home runs, not enough bunning, but you're starting to see in this short season, more bunning, more things happening, yeah. um, which I think, and then you look at the world series teams, you look at Boston, uh, nationals, Chicago Cubs, uh, Houston, you know, um, when you look at those teams, they didn't just hit home runs. They hit the ball all over the place. They did yeah. a lot of different things. Right. So yeah. He's that, going to look at that and say, well, wait a second. Are we doing the right thing here? Yeah, it takes, I mean, if you, in anything, it's not just baseball, it's in business in general. Um, there's uh, formulas, you know, and, and if everybody goes at the formula, somebody's going to be in last. Right. And then somebody in last is going to go, well, this doesn't work for us. Let's go right. in a different direction, <laughs> you know. So it, that's what I'm saying. It's like there's going to be a balance somewhere. But right now, this is the trend, and, and you're, you're seeing it. The, the strikeout rate in the big leagues is just incredible right now. So, you know, why change it if it's not broken? Another year or two down the road, and now hitters are getting on top of those fastballs that are up. All right, maybe you're going to start seeing guys sinking the ball more than actually elevating the ball. And it's, you know, it's cycle. History repeats itself. Well, I saw I saw Baez yesterday. You know, he bunted for a hit and scored a run doing it. You know, he was struggling a little bit as far as average. Um, but, you know, trying to hit the ball the other way. Okay, two things before we get the money ball real quick. Uh, rules. One, Major League Baseball is looking at the possibility of um, 
I believe it was you have to yeah you have to step off before you pick. You there, Darren? Well, we may have lost Darren. Technology does happen. Our shows are long, um, and we may have lost Darren. So we will take a break, folks, and we'll be right back. Um, D Darren Ebert, let me see. He'll come right back. Darren, you there? Unmute. Let me see if I can get him back. Yeah, Darren will be gone. He's coming right back. He'll check in. Folks, Pete Colander here, Baseball Outside the Box with Darren Ebert. Um, Darren, 10 years pitching coach with the Cincinnati. 2018, he was in the MLB staff. Um, he pitched uh, with three Hall of Famers in the big leagues, Maddox, Glavin, and Smoltz. Can you imagine that, being on that same staff, learning so much from him? Um, currently, he's one of the coaches with the Cincinnati Reds, was going to be a manager in their system, but COVID hit 19 hit and unfortunately can't do that. And famously played in the movie Moneyball. He played with Mike, uh, he played the role Mike Magnante, who was the left handed pitcher who got released at the trading deadline. And we have got um, Dennis back in. He'll be back in in one second. Um, and remember, folks, it goes to baseballoutsidethebox.com, the audio, and we'll be live also. We're live on Facebook, and we'll be on YouTube at Peter Caliendo. And we've got Darren back. How you doing, buddy? You back? All right. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, must that, have lost connection. No, it happens. It happens. We doesn't happen a lot, but once in a while, you know, during the show. But we're almost done, and we did a little commercial break there. And we're almost finished here. But I wanted to get your opinion. One, Major yeah. League Baseball was looking at, and possibly, you know, it could pass later on about pitchers if they're going to pick off stepping off first before they pick. Now, you know, I haven't had a chance to think about it, but off the top of my head, I, I don't like that already, but I don't know what your thoughts on that. Are. Uh, being a left-handed pitcher. Yeah. In other words, I cannot imagine not being able to pick the first without having to step off. So yes, that, that has been talked about. Um, we haven't heard anything. They were going to do it. I think at a ball on down this year to try mm -hmm. to test it out. And I think that's something you're going to see next year. You know, most of those things do get tested in the minor leagues. Um, yeah, so no just quick pivots for a righty trying to pick off the first. You got to completely disengage from the rubber in order, in order to throw. So they're just trying to create more action in the game, letting guys. So hey, imagine the average base dealers are going to just steal second and third like it's nothing. Yeah, this is going to be like Little League, you know, where yeah. you know, might as well put them on third to start off the inning. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, what about, you know, this is an interesting one because what, what I figured out was that, you know, relief pitchers have to pitch the three batters seems interesting. And one thing I figured out from it was, well, what's going to, if what, what's going to happen in the future, I would think is that you've got to find pitchers, uh, that can pitch to every type of hitter, um, in the lineup. Do you like that? And what else have you learned from it? Uh, at the beginning, I, I was not in favor of it. Now that I've seen it kind of play out. I, I do. I think I thought we were going to lose some strategy in the game. It's just implemented a different type of strategy. Right. Um, so I, I've actually I, I've enjoyed it because I'm all for that lefty specialist guy being a lefty guy myself. <laughs> but um, it just it just lets guys know that they can't be satisfied with where they're at. You got to keep developing. You got to keep getting better. Um, so those lefty specialists just come in and throw them, them lefty sliders to lefties. No more. You're going to, you're going to have to figure out a third pitch, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, and sometimes, you know, depending on how you know you see it, where it may be lefty, righty, lefty that he's got to face and they just walk the righty that's in between and let them face the two lefties. Um, but it's just part of the strategy. It's a different way of thinking of the game. And, and I think it's shown now that we just got to kind of look out like your show. We got to think outside the box a little bit, look at it a different way. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It may be different. We got to adapt to it and then, uh, and then figure out another way to beat you. All right. Super. Love it. Darren, let's finish it off with a great story. Um, I mentioned on the show before, a very good friend of mine, pitching coach with Team USA. We were together in Australia. Ken Medlock was in the movie Moneyball. Now, Ken is, a, is an actor. He's been in 50, I believe, 50 commercials and also um, uh, hits, you know, the sitcoms. But, you know, you never you know, we're an actor, you know, but obviously you've been in front of cameras because of, you know, being in the big leagues and all that. Uh, but interesting, talk about how you got to play Moneyball in a big role. I mean, it's not a small little role here. Um, talk about that because it'd be interesting to hear that story. Yeah, so um, 
I had just got done playing. I think I've been out a couple years. And a uh, buddy of mine that I grew up playing Little League with, uh, Steve Trombley, who has a, a program out in California called Trombley Baseball. Uh, mm-hmm. he, uh, he contacted me and said, hey, I know the casting director, and they're just looking for ex-players for this movie they're going to do. Uh, why don't you come out, hang out, you know, with the family, see the kids and stuff, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll both go down there and just do whatever, you know, and just kind of do it for the experience. So I, I went out to California and uh, went down there, and it was at, I think, Pierce College in L.A., and I hadn't picked up a ball in two years. You know, I was coaching high school basketball, you know, <laughs> so I get out there, um, get on the mound. I think I threw like four or five pitches. And then they had me say a couple things on camera, and that was it. You know, I, I go home. Three weeks later, I get a call from the casting director, and they, they asked me to come back out to uh, L.A. This time it was going to be at USC, and the, the director was going to be there, and they wanted me to come out for the final casting call. So I head out. Um, I get there, and uh, the director looks at me, puts me on the mound, and says, all right, you've given up seven runs this inning. I want to see how you can calm yourself down. And I just looked at him and I said, you seen the back of my baseball card? I've done this before. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he just starts kind of cracking up. And so I, you know, I walk around the mound, try to calm myself down. He's like, all right, now I want you to go snap in the dugout. You know, I want you to get mad. And so I, the baseball liaison was Chad Cruder for the film, who's also the head coach at USC. So it's all his stuff that we're using. So I look at Chad and I was like, I was like, He's like, okay, go ahead. You can take out the coolers. I'm like, okay. So I went and, you know, the old snap in the dugout, throw the cooler type thing. And that was it. You know, I didn't really do much else. I hopped on a plane and came back to Arizona. But by the time I landed here in Arizona, the director had left me a message on my phone saying that he was sending me a script and he wanted to see if I could read some lines. So I called him back and I was like, you realize I'm not an actor. You know, I thought I was just being an extra in a a film or something like that. And they said, no, I just want to see if you can deliver some. We liked what we saw, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, all right. So he sent me the script and the script was the, the scene where I get released or, or that he got let go. He got released. But I think in the, uh, in the video or in the movie, they were trying to portray it as him getting sent down. Um, but doing that, I've been released three times. I know how that conversation goes, you know? So I tell a lot of people when they ask, I said, that wasn't acting. It was only reminiscing, you know, (laughs) I've been down that road. So it was different. And, and the director, when I went in for the final casting call, he, he was very open to letting me kind of tell my story of me being released a few times. And we just kind of played back and forth and he ended up going more in that direction and thought it was more natural, at least for me, it was more natural when I did it the way that it was written for me to, you know, um, kind of beg for my job back. And that just doesn't happen. You get released, you get on the phone with your agent and try to find a job somewhere else. So um, it it was, it was a very interesting process to get there. And then uh, spending the nine weeks on set um, was, was with Madlock. I mean, we, we had a blast, you know, you get all these ex players and you put them on set in Sony studios, but they remade the locker room. We just became baseball players all over again. And you had to take that. Okay. You're, you're not an actor. So your scene or scenes, how many yeah. takes? Um, not as many as I was expecting. <laughs> I was That's expecting good. to really, really mess it up. But I, I think it took us like for that one scene, I think it took us like maybe an hour hour and a half to knock it out and a lot of that is is which I got used to it was frustrating at the beginning but they got to do it from all different sides so you do it one time and then you got to flip the camera and then you got to put cameras in all these different places and move microphones and all that stuff I have a a lot of respect for for those people that work behind the scenes to for me to go watch a two-hour movie in the theater somewhere I, I start doing that with my wife I'm like hey there, there's a there's a guy right behind that corner with a soundboard or something like that well that's what's amazing it's fascinating because I've never been on a, on a studio or in that in that situation where you know you're talking about some movies it takes months to make you know half a year to make a movie now did you ad lib any of it or did you have to stick to the script yeah, we actually, as we started, so they brought us in uh, when I actually had to do my scene with Brad Pitt. Um, we got there, I think, an hour before what they say the scene is hot. So we got there an hour early. It was just the two of us and the director. And we went the way it was written. And then we started playing it, you know, and kind of 
figuring out. The director would say, hey, let's try saying this or let's try, you know, and you just kind of played with it until the director liked it. And then we just went off of that. Wow. All right. Final question. I'll let you go because this is a great one. Uh, you're pitching the big leagues in front of 40,000 fans. What's more pressure, pitching the big leagues with 40,000 or per- <laughs> doing a scene with Brad Pitt when you never acted before? I, probably, I, I would say, at, if, if that would have been the first time I met him, it would have been there. But I would, I, I'll give you that Brad Pitt, I, I don't know if it was because it was the first movie he did where he could just be a guy and hang out and it wasn't. Mm-hmm you know, some, you know, big macho type dude or whatever. Like he played dominoes and spades and card. Like he was just like one of the guys in the clubhouse. So by the time I filmed that part, I felt relaxed with him. And and that's a credit to him, you know, for making us that aren't actors feel comfortable on set with him. Because if it was day one, yeah, it would definitely be that. Um, And then 40,000, I I remember my opening day in uh, facing the Phillies in Atlanta and, coming in I'd never relieved in my life I was a starter my entire career and then I got to the big leagues and I came in for Maddox in the seventh and oh. the first time they throw the ball around and who, who's the last guy and who flips it to the to the pitcher after they throw it around the third baseman and who's the third baseman Jipper Jones yeah hey good luck kid you know and then I, I turn around I look at 40,000 people in the stands and wow you know you skip a heartbeat there too so Absolutely. it's all about the situation but I, I would never trade either one I had a blast making the movie but uh being able to you know be a part of that that organization especially during that time in the 90s uh was a special time in Atlanta absolutely what a career and um you know you're lucky uh Chipper Jones didn't say uh get him out kid you better get them out, right? I mean, it's a lot of pressure, man. Darren, this has been great. I know you got a lot to do. You got Zoom calls with players and coaches and staff with the Reds and all that going on. So can't thank you enough, man. This was awesome. All right. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Pete. All right. That's Darren Ebert. Uh, don't forget, uh, go to baseballoutsidethebox.com for the audio and YouTube. Peter Caliendo, subscribe. The whole show will be on YouTube. Special thanks again to Darren Ebert with the Cincinnati Reds. Special thanks to our producer, Brian Kroc, with the Lineup Media Group. And also, of course, special thanks to everybody in the U.S. and around the world. Thanks for joining us again. Remember, we got over 100 countries listening to the show. Uh, just do us a favor, take the show, share them with others, so that way they can learn and we can spread the show out a lot more. So, again, thanks, everybody. Enjoy the day, and we will see you on the next show.